Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. You guys don't fool around. There's not like a lot of like things to read and announcements and uh, place, reasons for me to kind of hang out for a while. Um, I'm really happy to be here for oh, a variety of reasons. One is I grew up right in this area. I grew up in Cedar Grove right over the hill. And uh, I graduated from uh, Cedar Grove High School in 69 which gives you a little idea of my age, but uh, did a lot of drinking down this way. Actually, more in Upper Montclair, because if you come over Cedar Grove over Bradford Avenue, you come right down at Upper Montclair, and uh, I could tell you all the cool places we used to drink at like 16, hiding behind churches and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm also happy to be here because uh, Chris, who organized this, is my first sponsor and uh, somebody who really um, changed the shape of my life. Uh, because not only did I stop drinking, I actually changed um, my perspective, my view, my um, vision of how my life is to be conducted. So, for those reasons, I'm uh, delighted to be here, and uh, I'll kind of get, get right into it. Before I get into this, to the 10 steps specifically, let me give you a little bit of qualification of who I am and, and how I happen to be here in Montclair after graduating in 1969 from Cedar Grove. Um, Actually, I can tell you, I was an alcoholic, and one of my, one of my um, sort of um, defining alcoholic experiences was when I was in Cedar Grove. I was uh, probably around 14 or 15, and, and I was on a football team, and we went out uh, a bunch of, the, I started my first game and uh, played varsity, big deal, so I went out into the woods that night with, you know, maybe 20 or 30 guys. And there was a bonfire, and it's one of these, you know, scenes like out of a movie. The bonfire was this huge, as tall as a ceiling, and it was just a big circle of uh, of us around the bonfire, and um, we were passing around um, whatever we had, pot, beer, wine, vodka, whatever, and um, a bottle of uh, whiskey came by me. It was Cutty Sark. They, kid, they still kid me about this story when you hear it, uh, those who were there. And um, uh, so I drank some of this Cuddy Sark, right? And for me, that was the first, really the first uh, awakening of that, of that aller, allergy that, that I was to have for the rest of my life. Because it got a few guys down for me after I'd had it. And I immediately at that point had one thought. And that was, get that back, <laughs> okay? And I was like watching it go around the fire, and I'm thinking like, uh, I hope that guy doesn't drink any of it, and I hope that just gets passed around. And um, and what did happen is, when the bottle got back to me, I kept it, and I drank the entire bottle of Cutty Sark. I got thrown out of fo- off the football team. I got thrown out of school. Um, I. I guess they say I assaulted a teacher. Um, I had a physical fight with my father and said things to my mother, which still people won't repeat to me to this day, um, that evening uh, in a blackout. And um, as to how that changed my life, I was no longer on the football team or in school, but I had new friends to hang out with because they weren't fo- they weren't on the football team or in school, and I hung out with them, and I was drinking in the woods again the very next weekend. The very next weekend. And the thing that, that uh, is so clear to me is, is uh, how that relates to my first step experience, how the allergy works in me different than other people. There was no rational thought of, gee, I made a mistake. I need to kind of correct this mistake. Let me try and make up for this behavior. It was like, no, it's just the opposite. I wanted to repeat this behavior. Um, and the second thing was that um, in spite of how much trouble I was in, the obsession to do it was there. You know, how much trouble I was in was, you know, was irrelevant to me at that point. Um, so that was the kind of drinker I was very early on. So that was around 14 or 15. And uh, I drank and did drugs my whole life. 
I, I, I married very early. I was about just, just turned 21. And I only mention that because well, it was actually an important reason. So I, I started my family very young and um, never finished uh, college um, primarily because when I went back for my junior year, they told me you only have enough credits to return as a freshman. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? You know, and, uh, you know, my parents hadn't been keeping good track of it, and I'd been flunking most of my courses, and I actually had a lot of courses I dropped it into my parents about. So when they told me I was only a freshman, I said, oh, this, this is terrible. I'm not, why would I want to stay here? And uh, besides, there was a more lucrative thing to do in 1979 on college campuses, and that was sell drugs. So that's what I, I did, um, and then spent a couple years... Um, living out of a Volkswagen van, which was fun. So with that as background, I ended up um, actually through a series of crazy circumstances, ended up in a very good job. Fortune 500 company started as a sales merchandiser, very low job, but and without getting into all the details, worked my way up into very senior executive positions at several companies. The reason those things are important is because... Um, my life had begun to um, really be spin out of control as those um, events um, occurred. And I never really saw the pattern of it until I was in Alcoholics Anonymous and did a four-step. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Um, so I uh, had a very successful life, um, although I had a very dysfunctional family. You know, my kids were just really uh, out of control. And my life was um, one of uh, constant work and uh, leaving the house at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and getting home at 11. And that's just the way I, I operated. Traveled a lot. Worked in New York City. Um, all the usual things happened. I mean, I totaled three cars. Um, I was in trouble at work on a number of occasions. I had to leave one job. Uh, I was at a very important business function. And uh, I was missing from the dinner, and then they found me laying in a men's room in my own vomit. Um, so that really kind of messed that deal up a little bit. Um, and so uh, those experiences kept happening, but never really slowed me down. I didn't change my lifestyle at all. And I was the kind of drinker who my sister-in-law, who used to be one of my drinking buddies, um, she says to me today, she says, yeah, the problem with you was you were a Wednesday night blackout drinker. You know, it says the middle of the week, you decide you're going to drink from 4.30 until 4. And, um, and how could you live like that? You know, and that's, that's the way I lived. You know, I was a Wednesday night blackout drinker. Weekends really weren't important to me. It was just drinking. And, um, but I was able to function. And so what happened to me was there was no motivation for me to to quit. I tried quitting a couple times, could not do it, was unsuccessful, um, and went back. In late 97, early 98, my oldest son was um, in Carrier. He had a drug problem. And uh, I went for their family counseling, and it was evident very early on as I attended the family counseling that he must be t have been telling these counselors stuff because they kept looking at me, you know, like I'd show up like the good parent and they'd all stare at me like I almost had the impression like to go like, oh, here he comes, you know, and, uh, you know, and then I would sit in the family gatherings and have, you know, very good ideas on how everybody in the room should get sober, you know, and uh, so they asked us to... Um, create a, a safe environment for him, uh, take the alcohol out of our house and to not drink. Um, the fact was I could, I could not do that. I could not do it successfully. Um, when he was living at our house after leaving Carrier, um, it was not a safe environment. I was drinking. I was drinking in blackouts. I was um, uh, creating an environment that was certainly not conducive to someone who's just out of rehab and trying to get sober. So he relapsed, um, and uh, they, they called a family meeting. So they called us all down to Carrier, and uh, we get down there, and there were several counselors and several members of our family, and they started talking to my son for like 10 seconds, you know, and then they all turned to me, you know, and they go, and this meeting's really about you. And I'm thinking like, oh, my God. 
you got to be kidding me. And um, it wasn't sort of like an intervention like you see on TV or something like that. It was nothing like that, but, it, but the results were the same. They really coerced out of me promises that I didn't intend to make. And the promise came largely as a result of one counselor who came over to me. She stood up and she came across this small circle and she came to me and she kind of was wagging her finger in my face. And what she said was, um, I know exactly what you're thinking. You know, we're like halfway into this intervention, right? And, you know, what I'm, what I'm really thinking when she said that is, you know, F you, you know, I'm thinking, like, you, know, you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't even know me, you know? And she said, what you're thinking right now is, um, they had just finished suggesting that if I couldn't get sober, um, they should take my son out of the house and put him in a halfway house, you know, a place in Princeton. So if I couldn't get sober, that would be the alternative. And so she's pointing a finger at me. She goes, I know exactly what you're thinking. She says, you're thinking that the best outcome from this meeting we're having is for us to take him out of your house and put him in the halfway house because then we'll leave you alone and you can drink as much as you want. And that was exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> That's exactly. Only when I was thinking it, it didn't sound so bad. You know, the way she said it, it made it sound like I was completely self-centered and willing to give my son up as an exchange for my continued drinking, which is what it was, right? I mean, how can you, you can't avoid it when you say it out loud. And, um, and that was like being, being punched in the stomach. I really felt like, oh, my God, this is what I've come to? I'm willing to... Go here, take my son, leave me alone, I want a drink. How did I get here? And um, so they wanted to put me in a, a rehab right from there, and I, I talked them out of it, told them how important I was, and I could, you know, all this stuff. And, and uh, so what they did is they made a deal. The deal was that I would check in with my son's counselor twice a day, and I would do 90 and 90, and if I couldn't do that, um, I would go to rehab. So now I'm in a position where... My son's going to meetings. I'm going to meet different meetings. I have to check in with my son's counselor twice a day and have to pay her for it, you know. And, um, and I hated it. You know, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be in these rooms. I didn't want to be with people who had a drinking problem. And I certainly didn't want to spend the rest of my life in church basements. That wasn't something I had signed up for. Um, I was the last one in. I was the first one out. Um, I didn't get a sponsor. And I, uh, I didn't, I wasn't drinking, but I have to tell you that, that my, my personal experience is that my bottom really wasn't during my drinking um, life. Uh, although I could tell you, I could stand up here and tell you drunk log stories all night, you know. Coming home, dry, leaving cars in the driveway totaled. And then going out, and my wife telling me later that I went out in the yard to try and put pieces back on naked, you know, <laughs> the spotlights out there, and the neighbors were all came over to see what was going on. Um, so, you know, I'm not without those kind of stories, but, but that, my bottom really was, um, was during those first 90 days. Because as, as I refused to be a part of AA and yet didn't drink, um, the guilt and remorse were incredible. You know, I started to really have clear images of what I had done to my wife, uh, even, in, even in, in physically. Not that I um, uh, attacked her, but, you know, there would be times when I would hold her or shake her. Or my kids, you know, there was physical encounters with my kids. And, and also, um, a continued recognition at the time, or guilt on my part, that all their problems, their drug problems and school problems were because of me. And so... Um, I hit this bottom where um, I'd start to go to meetings, and uh, maybe around 90 days or at some point, I was feeling this guilt and remorse. And so my, you know, I'd raise my hand at a meeting, and I'd start to share, and then I'd start to cry. I can't believe it. My and that was okay once or twice, but, you know, people get tired of that, you know? <laughs> and they started to come up to me after meetings saying, hey, like, you need some help, you know what I mean? And... Uh, and it, people started giving me their phone numbers, and one thing led to another. And uh, I attended um, a big book workshop that Chris was putting on, Chris Schroeder. And um, I went in there, and I, I was in late, maybe 10 minutes late. And I could see that they were using a form, which turned out to be a four-step form. So, you know, 
And everyone's leaving, so I go up to him after the meeting and say, hey, could I see that form? Could I, could I have one of those? And he looked at me and he said, no. <laughs> I don't think this would be good for you. And I knew that was a bad answer because he's really a really nice guy, and I knew that he was going to say something else. So I tried to leave really quick. <laughs> But the guy I'd given a ride to was from the VA hospital. He was a veteran. He, stayed, he was in, a, in the VA hospital. And he wanted to stay in here, what Chris had to say, because he just didn't want to go back to the dorm. You know? he didn't want to. So I said, listen, Bob, we're leaving. And Chris says, uh, the reason I won't give you this form is it's like you know, giving you, a, you know, uh, a weapon that you don't even know how to use or whatever, how he said it. And he said, but I'll tell you what I will do. If you come over to my house next Wednesday and make a commitment to keep coming back, We'll work our way towards this form, and I'll tell you exactly how to use it. And I said, no way. You know, I'm not going to your house. Come on. It's bad enough I've got to go to church basements. And um, the, the, guy, the guy who was with me, uh, Bob V., who I still see to this day, who was in the VA hospital, to him, that was the best news you could have given him. He's living in a VA hospital, and this guy's saying we can go to his house. And I know he was imagining, oh, good, we get coffee and cake and we could sit in a nice warm house for a few hours, you know. And so he says, let's go, Ron. We'll go. We'll go every week. And I'm like, oh, my God. So um, we started going. And um, my personal story, I'm not making this as a, as a, as a, as a way of, uh, of working the steps, but my personal experience was I have no knowledge of this first, second, and third step with, with that first experience because I was completely resistant. I was completely resistant to whatever he said. It was just out of my head. You know, I was like, I don't know if any of you had this experience, but, you know, if you're doing speed, you can't wait for the next guy, to, that guy to stop talking so you can say what you want to say. I, I had no interest in what he had to say at all. And... Um, but I got so miserable, and I was crying in these meetings. We came back for a meeting um, just before going into the fourth step. And I can remember having this um, experience. Um, I, I, at that time, I wouldn't have called it a spiritual experience because I really had no relationship with a higher power. I was an uh, atheist coming in here. Um, and um, I almost had a kind of a breakdown. Not physically that he would have noticed, but internally, I was just desperate. I said, you know what? I do not know what's going on. My life is a mess. I've been drinking my whole life and doing drugs, and my family's out of control. My um, whole this family life is out of control. Cause my, my daughter was also in a lot of trouble at school and with drugs at the time. Everything was spinning out of control, and um, I thought I was in control, and I obviously wasn't. And, and I was sitting there in front of him with this other guy, Bob, and uh, I looked at him at this one point, and I said to myself, you know what? I'm, I'm desperate. I have no, I have no, I was almost ready to cry then, too. I have no idea what is going on. I have no idea what's going on. And it, it was actually a physical, a visceral experience, because I asked him if he had a pen or a pencil, because suddenly I wanted to take notes. Up until then, I didn't even... I took home the sheets he gave me. You know what I mean? I don't think I was, I wasn't engaged. And um, I can remember taking that pencil and just writing and asking him questions and saying, now what did you say before? Uh, it was almost like I had woken up. Like I had completely surrendered and at the same time woken up enough to ask questions and want to know why, I, like, why am I here? You know, what is it you were trying to accomplish? What are we going to do next? It was just whatever he was going to do, whatever he had in mind for me, I was going to go along with it. And I said that to myself, I'm going to do whatever this guy says, because I am just failing. And the result of that is I did a, uh, um, you know, the kind of uh, uh, fourth and fifth step through ninth step that is outlined at this meeting. It was a very thorough fourth step. It was a profound spiritual experience for me, one that, I'll, um, that completely changed my life. You know, when I got to the fourth step of my resentment inventory and realized the truth about my self-centered fears... Um, I was astounded. I was blown away. And I'll circle back to some of my earlier comments about my personal history. I saw that my anger towards my children and my resentment towards my children was founded on the fact that I'd gotten married at 21 and had kids right away. And the truth was, I didn't think I was a good father. I was afraid I wasn't a good father. I was afraid to be a father. And that fear resulted for me in anger. You know what I mean? Want to put a good defense up if you're afraid? Act angry. You know what I mean? Act as though you know what should happen. You know, be a boss. Tell them what to do. 
um, be dissatisfied. Um, and I saw the truth about that too because um, I, the reason I really wanted to do well was so that it would appear that I'm a good father. You know what I mean? So that I'd look good because I didn't feel that I was a good father. So I had all of my children's best interests tied up in me. You know, it was about me. And then I got to the fourth column of my wife, and lo and behold, it was the same thing. You know, I realized that all of the resentments and um, negative feelings I had toward her were the result of my own feelings of inadequacy. The truth is, I didn't feel like I could be a good husband. I didn't know how to be a good husband. I probably wasn't a good husband. And so it resulted in, in um, my constantly clashing with her. You know? And so those truths totally changed the shape of my life. When I finished that fourth column on my resentment inventory, I, I had my first spiritual experience. I saw the world differently. I saw the truth about my self-centered behavior. And it completely spun me around. Um, I, com- I finished my fifth, sixth, and seventh step and, and got through to, to my amends. And, you know, at that time, you know, what I was encouraged to do is get to those amends quickly. And I had them all done in the first year. And even the amend that I had absolutely said, absolutely, with un- unequivocally, I will not make this amends to this person. Um, he had actually hurt a member of my family, was prosecuted and found guilty. And I was able to, it was the last one, <laughs> but I did make amends to that person. And the per- reason I made an amends to that person wasn't to validate his behavior, but was because my approach to him had been uh, based on vengeance and retaliation. That's what I had in my mind. And I no longer wanted to live like that. I no longer wanted to be that person. And what I did is I met him and was able through, through the amends process to set him and myself free from both of those notions retaliation and violence. And uh, I haven't seen him since, <laughs> um, but I no longer carry any, um, any animosity towards him. So those kind of changes happened, and as those amends um, were, were completed, um, I really saw the truth about my self-centeredness because I really had believed I understood how my relationships with other people uh, emerged and how they took place. I really thought I understood relationships. And amends in particular taught me that that wasn't true, that I didn't really understand my relationships at all. Because often I would go to someone and make amends, and they would say to me, oh, yeah, that happened. But what really bothers me is this. And then they'd tell me something altogether different that I would almost not, you know, recognize. Uh, So it really taught me how little I understood, how little attention I was paying towards these relationships. Um... That all was about almost 14 years ago. I've been in AA, uh, and and, uh, since then I haven't relapsed. I've been uh, very active in this program, um, not only uh, attending meetings but sponsoring other men. Um, I currently sponsor quite a few men, um, probably 10, I I guess, right now, and I'm very busy with that. Um, And it's a process that, to me, is really gratifying and emotionally um, rewarding. Um, I think sponsorship is the most important thing I can do in AA. So my entire life was changed. Yes, I don't drink anymore, but more importantly than that, my life has changed on every relationship basis I can think of. My relationship with my family changed. My relationship with my friends changed. My relationship with my in-laws changed. My relationship at work changed. My relationship with a higher power changed. My relationship with how I walk in the world changed. So AA gave me that perspective, that new vision, that new um, awakening that is often talked about um, in this in this book. So that brings us to the 10th step. Um, and I want to talk about the 10th step today in a, in a kind of a clearer way that I've been able to look at over the last few years, last say three or four years, I've looked at the 10 step much differently and I, I want to share some of that with you tonight. First thing I want to say is what I have found over the years is that very often the 10 step is referred to as the nightly review. People would say, oh, I'm not doing my 10 step anymore. I've got to get busy on my 10 step and I realize what they're talking about is their nightly review. And very often that nightly review or that inventory at the end of the day was what people referred to as a 10 step. And that's got nothing to do with the 10th step. It's not in the 10th step. It's actually part of the 11th step. The first paragraph 
in the 11th step is when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. That's the first paragraph in step, in step 11. And as I began to go through these steps more frequently with sponsees, in this step in particular, I got really clear for me as to what this step was intended to do. I want to, uh, it's only got three paragraphs, and, and it's broken into three sections. One paragraph is a set of the clearest, most um, succinct instructions I've ever seen on how to live your life. Really a, like, a, a, like a, an outline of conduct. How should you behave? Second paragraph is a paragraph of promises, which basically link up and say, if you live that kind of life, if you conduct yourself in that way, here's what you can expect. And then the third paragraph is, I've tried to think of a cleverer word for it, but I call it the warning paragraph. <laughs> and it, 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 it gives you uh, several warnings about what you can expect if you fall off this, uh, off this step um, and sort of the benefits if you stay on it. So... Um, First, let me read the paragraph that I think is the introduction to it. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Now, people think that's part of the ninth step, and I guess it is, except for in the very next paragraph it says, this thought, the thought I just gave you, brings us to step 10. So it really strikes me that that paragraph is an introduction to step 10. So what it's really saying is, these promises are beginning to come through in your life. They're being fulfilled for you. They'll always materialize if you work for them. And what's the work they're referring to? Step 10, okay? This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests... Now, here are some of the instructions they give you. It's only a paragraph worth of instructions. Suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Now, it doesn't say review them at the end of the night. It says pay attention to these mistakes and, and, and correct them as we go along. I'm not saying there's not a place for a review, but I am saying that's a spiritual practice that's part of step 11. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So what it's referring to is we may not even be done with our ninth step yet. We're generally not done with our ninth step. We're still cleaning up our past, and now we're working on our tenth step. Okay? So as we're finishing our ninth step, we're in the tenth step. Vigorously commence this way of life, of living as we clean up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function, and here's another instruction, is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. And what I believe is being said there is there's got to be a focus on continued spiritual development. You know, how you do that is individual it is as individual as how you see your higher power. But a continued focus on spiritual development is very specifically referred to here. Um, this is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. So now here's even more specific instructions. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Now these four have been repeated over and over again. They started showing up in the third step. They were specifically spelled out in your fourth step. They were spelled out in the fourth column with fear, dishonesty, and self-centeredness. They were spelled out in your um, fear inventory. Um, so those four continue to move along with us, and they are things that we should you know, have in our mind and be focused on. So we continue to look for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. Instructions for prayer. So, um, you know, we sometimes hear that we don't pray for ourselves. In this context, we do. As soon as we see selfishness, resentment, dishonesty, and fear cropping up, we need God to step in. Because if we think that we're going to change them, I am right back into my ego again, right? Oh, I'm really screwing up. I need to change. It even sounds contradictory coming out of my mouth. How can I change myself if I'm the one who keeps screwing up? I, need, I am powerless, so I need to source a higher power. That's where prayer comes in. All right? I can't make a decision to not be selfish. I have to turn that over. I need to seek a higher power to give me that power to, to, to show me the way towards to, to be unselfish. So as soon as I see selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, I ask God at once to remove them. 
you know, and I'm, I do this. I, I am looking for those characteristics, and I'm saying those prayers during the day. Um, next, we discuss them with someone immediately. Okay? So, all right, I got two instructions on how to live my life. If I'm living a life that's filled with selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, I need to get into prayer quickly, and I need to talk to someone immediately. It doesn't say, you know, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, call your sponsor. It says, you know, with, do we discuss them with someone immediately? And so I need to seek out someone else for the same reason I just referred to. Because if I think I know what's right, okay, and I'm going to make a decision about how to correct this bad behavior, who's making that decision? It's me again, the same person who's, who's you know, initiating the bad behavior. So I've got to seek God, and I've got to seek others for advice and counsel. And then make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. That makes sense, too. Next instruction. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. That's the next instruction. So when I'm in a place where I am suffering as a consequence of my selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I have prayer, I have others, and I have an opportunity to help someone else. It does not say, find another alcoholic. And I think it's great to find another alcoholic. Don't get me wrong. If your sponsor tells you, go talk to another alcoholic when you're in a bad way, that's a perfectly good instruction. But I'll tell you this. Many times, in order to get my behavior righted, to get back on track, I need to be good to the people around me. Okay? I don't need to be, to take them for granted in order to get to an AA meeting quickly to help another alcoholic, okay? The first person I can help in my house is my wife. All right? That's the first person I can help because she's the closest person to me, she's the most intimate person in my life, and she's probably the one who takes the most shit, okay? So why wouldn't that be the first person I can help? All right? My kids, a neighbor, it can be anyone, but I need to be paying attention to who can I help. Um, and then it finishes with something that I found a couple of years ago. I found this, and I couldn't believe it was there, and I had to sit with it for a while. I had to really sit with it before I decided I wanted to talk about it. So I know that they say there's no rules in AA, okay? That we don't have any, you know, rules. But this next sentence implies that this club does have a code, all right? And if you want to be a part of a club, this is sort of the code. All right? And back in this, and they use the word code, by the way. And in the 30s, the word code was used differently than we might use it now. It was applied very seriously, like a code of conduct. Or when you, joined, when you went to the Marines, you swore to uphold a code. You know, the idea of a code was a very strict way of viewing your behavior. So the last line says, we have, we have uh, harmed anyone, and we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. And the sentence finishes by saying, love and tolerance of others is our code. That's the AA code. How well do I live up to that love and tolerance code? So I'll read it even faster. Do you realize in like six sentences, there's a um, many times in AA they say there's a design for living. Okay? And you can't go to a chapter and say, oh, where's the chapter that says design for living? This book isn't written that way. It's not a PowerPoint presentation, um, but it'd be easier if it was. But um, but if you want to look at if you want to see where the um, where the design for a living is in a very short, succinct, easy to read paragraph, here it is. We vigorously commence this way of living as we clean the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss it with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. All right? Go, my brother, and do otherwise, you know? Um, so that's, that's what the, the, step, the step is all about. How do I conduct myself? How do I in- interact with other people? Um... How do I behave? You know? Um, now, if I behave this way, it says, and these are the 10th step promises, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. 
we react sanely and normally. And we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe, and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And so there's this emphasis on our continued spiritual growth. So we have instructions, we have promises, and that we have, for what, want of a better word, the paragraph that's a warning. <laughs> Uh, it, is, it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle fault. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. We can, these are thoughts which must go with us constantly. Not only every day, but constantly. I think they're driving us home here, right? Um, we can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. So, to me, um, step 10 is a, is a, is a set of instructions. I said it over again. I'm not going to bore you with it. I'll tell you how I've been using it recently with my sponsees and what I do myself. You know, when they get halfway through step nine, when they've completed a number of their amends, I'll move right into this step ten. And what I'll do is I'll I'll go through it exactly the same way we did it tonight. And then I'll do is give them these instructions. Um, Take a part of um, the instructions. And use that in prayer and meditation for several days or a week. And ask yourself, are you doing that? Say, for instance, um, we, look, we look for um, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. In the morning, with your prayer and meditation, ask yourself, am I doing that? And then just sit quietly. And examine whether or not that's become part of your life. Um, when these crop up, do we ask God at once to remove them? Sit with that for a few days. Ask yourself that question. Do you do that? Is that now a practice that you've become um, attuned to? Um, and, and to do that with these different sentences and just sit with these day after day. Is this where I'm at? Am I willing to do this? Is this a practice I'm now, I've now made a part of my life? And then I ask him to do the same thing with the promises and take each one of the promises and sit with them for a couple of days, maybe in correspondence with the instructions, and ask yourself, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Take that one sentence. Ask yourself that question. Is it true for me? And sit with it. Take the next promise. Uh, we are seldom interested in liquor. Is it true for me? How do I now see that? So that you can begin to understand if those promises are coming true in your life. And if they are coming true in your life, not what you think about them, but how do you feel about it? All right? It's not what I not what I intellectually want to tell you about it. It's how do you feel about it? Do you feel it's true for you? Do you feel it's actually taking place in your life? Is it something that's actually um, not a question, but a a feeling that comes up? And so that's what I've been doing with uh, the 10-step quite a bit. And uh, it's been a learning process for me. Um, I'm not trying to... um, take anything away from the nightly review. I just, I just want to say that that is part of the 11th step. It's a spiritual practice, and it's an important spiritual practice, and I endorse it. But there's more to the 10th step than the nightly review. The 10th step is, is an outline for living. And when I read it, it really reminds me, and probably nothing jumps out of that more to me than the line, uh, love and tolerance of others is our code. And I try to remember that you know, when I go out into my daily life, I try to remember that at home. 
And I try to remember it in AA rooms <laughs> because sometimes it doesn't work, you know. And, uh, and I try to ask myself, is that the kind of person I am today? Has is love and tolerance become a code of my life? And have I ceased fighting everything and everyone? Because if, and I'm not saying that that's a way that I live my life on a constant basis, but when I am in that place where love and tolerance of others is, is a state of being, and where I have ceased fighting anyone or any, anything or anyone, I am at peace. I am in a good place. Um, because I fought everybody and everything for a long time. You know, I can tell you, I was the first one to say no. So um, that's my summary on, uh, on step 10. And I want to thank you for letting me uh, be a part of your meeting tonight. Um, Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.